What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is February 4th of 2019. Well, folks, I hope you all are having a great day wherever you are. And today we've got a good range of topics to discuss for both crypto and traditional markets. For crypto, we're not only going to be discussing where we are in the longer term cycle of price action, but also some exciting news out of IBM coming out with a killer application for blockchain and Venezuela coming out with some really positive cryptocurrency legislation with a few catches for mining. In regards to traditional markets, we'll be talking about central banking, Japan, and volatility, a wide range of topics to discuss. So without further ado, let's not push it off any longer and dive right into the the update. Now I want to let you guys know real quick the video is sponsored by Yellow. If you guys haven't checked out the YouTube channel, uh, they've become a long-term sponsor on the channel here. Uh, they've got a lot of great content coming out and I really recommend you watch the, one of their new videos. Uh, this is Steve from the team at Yellow. I met him personally back in Chiang Mai. They've got some really interesting content. They're building out a new office space. So really recommend you check it out. Consider subscribing to the channel. All right, so taking a look over the broader market, things are a little unchanged across the board for cryptocurrencies. But boy, if there is someone who's gaining in this market, it's BitTorrent. Now, again, guys, I want to always um, hint a sense of caution here. The thing about a lot of these uh, tokens and stuff, especially in a bear market, is you're going to get a lot of speculation coming in. So a lot of traders start actively trading, not to mention, especially if there's a fiat pairing. So they have USD Tether, or yeah, I don't know if you want to call that a fiat, fiat pairing, <laughs> depending on how much you think they're really backed. But then again, I guess the fiat system isn't really backed by anything outside of trust. But Anyways, in this sense, uh, you know, in all reality here, I mean, you have the, the common technical pattern where you break out of previous highs on the market and then you have a continued rally, you get volume coming in here. And it's it's quite expected that this stuff kind of happens, but at the same time, you have to be cautious. Uh, you know, what's nice is that we are at a $44 million market cap, which means that, you know, if this system does actually build out, it could be worth much more. But I'll be honest, with the volume to market cap, this is a little a little too much at this point, right? Um, it, it definitely concerns me here. I think there's a little too much rampant speculation without any serious product built. But again, we've seen in the crypto space, it doesn't really need that. I'm more worried that there's not enough hype in the market right now to really carry this to becoming a major cryptocurrency so at the moment just be cautious on this guys don't get caught into the fomo that's how you lose on trading and uh, see if this uh you know comes back to a more reasonable level if you really want to speculate at least in my opinion that's, that's just my opinion on it so i'm not trading it um, i don't think i'm missing out on much right at the moment so I want to spend some time though to dive in more specifically into markets and everything and talk about some of the key indicators because as as I was just emphasizing you know we haven't really entered into a full swing bear market at the or excuse me no we've been in a full swing bear market but we haven't entered into anything that signals a serious reversal yet but I think we're starting to get some of the signs that we're reaching the lows in this market we're starting to get a little bit more confident um, Outside of volume here, we've got some of the price indicators here that can signal a little bit of confidence for us to moving uh, in regards to moving forward. So this is the daily chart right here, but I actually don't want to look at the daily. When I look at long-term trends, folks, even in cryptocurrencies, which is a a very short market comparative to say gold and silver markets and equities and you know bonds or whatever we want to talk about, it is a very very short window of time. Even if you get exchanges like Bitstamp, which we're on, which is trading since back in 2011. But even in these shorter markets, you want to look at the monthly and the weekly. You do not want to look at the daily. Daily will not give you that much information, whether you're using moving averages, RSI, um, you know, MACD, you know, even just some of those simpler indicators, which really I think are really the only indicators you really need to be using um, for doing the longer term trends here. And I'll emphasize why that is, because Bitcoin has laid out everything perfectly for us from its previous market cycle, especially the one back in 2014 and 2015. And we see a lot of the same bottoming patterns that we saw previously, as well as in a lot of interesting indicators like NVT, uh, which is what we talked about in our newsletter this month, uh, net value. Uh, transaction net uh, net value to transactions, uh, but in this case, there's a lot of interesting things we can go through that simply you can plug it onto a chart in regards to trading view. So, I've got them up here. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So we're getting off the daily here, and we're going to the weekly now. Taking a, a shrunken in price view, I'll go ahead and mention some of the things that I really like to look at. The three of my favorite indicators for picking market bottoms and or understanding when things are oversold or that we've gone into a, a period of uh, kind of fear and or lack of interest in this case. Sometimes it's not all panicky. Maybe we've gotten through the panic phase and now people have just kind of lost interest because people want to ride things when they're going to the upside or speculate. The three indicators that I like to use are the 200 week, 
so in this case, nice long-term indicator, a very similar indicator, which is the 50-month. This is very good for cryptocurrencies as well, in my opinion. And the third one is both the uh, a mixture of the weekly and the monthly RSIs. So let's go ahead and dive through each of these one by one, and we'll, we'll get a good little assessment of where we are. So let's talk about that 200-week we talked about. Well, we've already tapped it right here. In fact, we make direct contact here back during when we were pulling back up. Sorry, I got to run the wrong candle there. Uh, but we had direct contact with the 200 week here as we got the rebound of markets. And it looks like we're very close to retesting it again. So in this case, yeah, just a few dollars away, just about a, ten, a few ten, um, about a few dozen dollars away from actually touching back with the 200 week, which is slowly rising up here over time, obviously, as we had a major uptrend over the past 200 weeks. But in this case, again, showing a sign that we might be holding some confidence here. And look what happened last time when we were bottoming the market, made contact two times here with the 200 week. So again, very important bottoming indicator, not to mention while we're on the weekly here, take a look at the weekly RSI back here in 2015, or excuse me, in 2014 going into 2015. Double bottom here on the RSI. Now, if you actually take a look at the price, the price declined a decent steady amount. So in this case, in order for the RSI to come down, uh, we're going to probably need a a retest of 3,200 and maybe even a retest to 3,000 uh, in this case. Again, really touching that big even and along with that, bringing the RSI down to a similar level that we saw before. But generally, double bottom in the RSI is what I'm going to care about more in this case, being oversold two times on the weekly and getting matching volume to the buy side, pushing price back up. That's what's really going to build confidence for me. So again, you can see here similar patterns in the overbought nature, but also potentially in the oversold patterns as well. Again, most people don't look at this kind of stuff, guys, so it's important to look at these longer-term time frames. And one thing that I really love, really, really love here for a chart uh, that is only going as far back as 2011 is both the 50-month and the RSI for the monthly. Take a look at this down here. Price tapped right on to the 50-month and then continued moving higher here for Bitcoin in regards to the 50-month. And we're getting really, really close to this indicator here. In fact, it's riding up perfectly a little bit above 3,000, as you can see indicated in the top left corner, the green text there next to the TSM, uh, TSMA indicator, which is my three moving average indicator. But we only have a 50 month to deal with because we haven't had 100 months in this case of moving average to consider into the price. So in this case, we're getting very, very close to that. Um, and the other thing as well, and take a look at the RSI here. Same peak around here on the overbought range, around the upper 90, per, uh, 90 point range in the RSI, and lower point range here for the RSI. Now we can see here, there's two things I analyze. First off, I'm getting eager because, oh look, you know we're coming at the same level here, and I think we're gonna hold around here as well. But the thing is, we can see that it can take some time before we actually start getting buying pressure and price pushing up to the upside. So this doesn't mean that the market's going to rebound right now. It doesn't mean it's going to shoot up like a rocket. Sometimes we have to wait patiently for the market to bottom properly. So those are really a few things that I recommend looking into. I recommend you guys looking into NVT. Uh, and if you guys look into it and you might not have a full grasp or understanding about it and you want to learn more, love to talk about it in the next daily update or do a specific video on it, maybe for a, a trading tip video. We haven't done one of those in a while. There's just We've gone through most of the material on it. But yeah, let me know if you guys would be interested in that. But nonetheless, we have done enough on uh, market analysis for cryptocurrencies. We'll do a little bit on equities later. Let's go ahead and talk about the killer blockchain application, folks. IBM has found the golden goose, or the, the golden egg in this case, the, the goose has laid the golden egg at IBM. And they have now found a way to ship 28 tons of oranges on the blockchain. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We have found the ultimate killer application that is going to convince every business that they need blockchain. All right, enough of the corny joke here. Basically, IBM actually uh, test ran a new technology that they've been building out. And I understand, uh, look, I, I know there's a debate between public and private blockchain technology. And of course, I believe actually there's a, there's room for both. Uh, you know, there, there will be a variety of companies that don't you know, worry so much about uh, the trust factor, but rather just building automated systems that remove unnecessary middlemen. And there are some businesses who want to get rid of these middlemen. Um, I can give you an example in, in the, the, the commerce space, you know, why uh, Kroger actually shut off, uh, I think it was Visa and MasterCards uh, from some of the retailers in California because of the fees that they're charging. You have to think that the business world is very, uh, as much as there are some centralized powers who do not want to see blockchain and uh, public blockchains come up, a lot of them will 
you know, use a mixture of public and private blockchains, whatever benefits their business in this case. And people have very differing business interests. All right, well, I went on a tangent there. Anyways, going back to our original story we're talking about, they basically shipped tw uh, 28 tons of Mandarin oranges, I love Mandarin oranges, or 3,000 cartons containing approximately 108,000 fruits, where they were delivered ahead of Chinese New Year celebrate the Chinese New Year celebration on February 5th. Um, in this case, the main shipping document, the bill of lading or the bill of um, uh, of cargo in this case, was recorded on a blockchain. So they actually have this blockchain system that automated a process that usually has a bunch of um, unnecessary, what seemed like unnecessary middlemen to facilitate that a transaction has happened, that everything has met the requirements, they did everything in this case, automated in this case. So it's very exciting. And they brought a process uh, that usually takes five to seven days down to one second. And I think this just goes again to show, you know, it leads to a question, how has this been able to proliferate for so long? Why have we settled for a system that takes so much money? In fact, it's like, I got the actual like costs of the industry that they have to face in regards to middlemen gets into the billions, uh, but like on an annual basis. But Outside of that as well, something that can take so long. The kind of the kind of inefficiencies we remove by bringing this time down to just one second, I mean, is incredible stuff. So I'm very excited about this. And they have a quote here saying, by using the EBL, in this case, this is basically the, the name of the system they've built. Uh, we have seen the entire shipment process can be simplified and made more transparent with considerable cost savings. Ty Kim back, the chairman of the CEO and fruit importer, Hupko said in the press release. And along with this, um, I, I like this as well. Um, you know, I had no idea about this, and I've studied, I've done a decent amount of you know research in the supply chain uh, industry. But I was so shocked to figure out that 40% of all fraud that exists or document fraud accounts in regards to the shipment industry. So 40% of that derives from this industry. These middlemen, which you're paying so much for in this case, can lead to 40% of all of document fraud that we have in existence. So in this case, I'd love to see tamper-proof blockchain-based systems come into existence. And what I really see, I know there's a lot of people who have invested in supply chain tokens and you know, these platforms, and I'm really excited to see what Walton Chain does, VeChain, um, you know, uh, Wabi, you know, there's a lot of cool projects out there. But I will, I do feel that uh, this is one industry where a variety of the major conglomerates uh, in this space, a lot of the major supply chain companies would build a private blockchain between one another and they'd be almost kind of delegates on a permission chain. Uh, though that might kind of kill off some of the benefits, I feel like that's probably what's going to happen. But either way, I don't know. We'll have to see in due time. I'm more than anything excited to see that we're shipping oranges with the blockchain, folks. It's the 21st century. All right. So going on here, I want to talk uh, a little bit about Venezuela and discuss the importance of the recent legislation they put out. Now, I'll be honest, this is actually contrary to what I believed would happen in Venezuela. Um, it, it's becoming more clear as to what Venezuela really cares about. Venezuela actually just proposed a set of regulations and a, a, a have developed new branches of government that are actually going to decide over cryptocurrency uh, regulation. But along with that, it also printed out a decent set of standards where they actually seem quite pro-cryptocurrency. Now, we already know about the Petro and things of that sort, and we would probably all guess, oh, you know, let me guess, Maduro is just basically supporting the Petro and using the Petro for business. But they're actually supporting pretty much all cryptocurrencies. There is a catch, though, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So they basically cr created these intendancies, or these are basically branches under an organization known as Sunacrip. Uh, and in this case, they're going to be managing in four different regards, digital mining and similar processes, maybe digital staking in this case, promotion and development of digital assets and relative act uh, related activities, crypto financial services, and audits on cryptocurrencies. So it's interesting to kind of see that they've built these, you know, there's there's no government that I can think of, maybe outside of a few uh, island nation states that are really trying to become pro-crypto that have this kind of degree of support. But overall, it, it, you know, again, you, you get this kind of, um, this account that they're actually eager to move forward and actually build a framework around this. And if you go through the article, they actually have quite a positive tone on allowing merchants to, uh, and individuals to use cryptocurrencies. But the catch that you'll find as you go down here uh, in this case is in regards to some of the uh, violations in this case, and it mostly has to do with mining. So if a user, for example, is mining cryptocurrencies and doesn't register it with the government, the vast majority of people mining Bitcoin <laughs> who have ASIC miners uh, are not registering with the government, they can pay up a fine of over $6,800 um, in this case. and 
in this case, the ASIC miner will be retained. So the government's going to take it. And this is the whole reason why people don't go to the government in the first place because they're fearful that the government's just going to seize their miner, even if they register it in this case. And there was a lot of horror stories where this actually happened in Venezuela. And it's just, it's a, it's a corrupt government, guys. It's understandable. Um, and in this case, it's it's a way where they can hedge as well with their currency, uh, basically being able to mine cryptocurrency. So again, basically it has to do with the mining process. In this case, most of these are negative. Uh, they also get to establish the fees that are charged by intermediaries and exchanges. I don't like that, but again, most intermediaries, uh, at least international ones, aren't dealing in Venezuela right now, um, especially if you're like a US-based company or European-based company. So again, I think some of these things are, are quite negated in this case. The average person probably won't be mining, but I like this right here. This is really what sends the, the kind of pro-crypto signal. The Venezuela state shall promote, protect, and guarantee the use of crypto monedas as means of payment in public institutions, private, mixed, or joint enterprises inside and outside the national territory. Gotta say, that's pretty good to see. Uh, I, I don't know, this probably isn't at the helm of Nicolas Maduro, but uh, I will say uh, hats off to Venezuela for doing that. I appreciate it, but I still have my doubts in certain regards, So, uh, especially in the mining uh, aspect. No one's gonna register their miners in this case, so it could just be a win-win in this case, or a win and things unchanged for miners. So moving on to traditional markets, we gotta talk about what happened here, folks. Equity markets popped up last month. Did you spot it? Central bank's balance sheet, the global central bank balance sheet between the major three players, the Fed, ECB, and BOJ, not to mention if you got the full statistics, the full bank balance sheet, it popped up even more. How did this happen? Well, I know it wasn't the US central bank, the Federal Reserve, we've been tampering off the central bank balance sheet. It's probably not too much the ECB, I know they're talking about cutting QE, it must be the Bank of Japan, and we'll take a look at this, guys. If we go ahead and take a look at some of the major central banks here, we can see the ECB bumped up a little bit, about one or two, uh, I would say probably anywhere between one to 250, or excuse me, 100 to $250 billion. We got the Fed continuing to taper off here. The People's Bank of China bolstering probably a good $300 billion to the central bank balance sheet here. And the Bank of Japan rallying the central bank back up to all time highs in regards to its balance sheet. So. Interesting enough, isn't it? The month where markets had a stark rebound, a major rebound, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and we see a major pump up in the central bank balance sheet. Wow, go figure in this case. But again, this leads me to two things here, guys. Uh, it's a very obvious correlation. What has led to equity markets doing very well over the past few years is the acquisition of assets from central banks. And it also puts the United States in a very interesting case because the U.S. is continuing to taper in this case. It's continuing to run off, even though Powell has talked about potentially freezing off the tapering or slowing, uh, slowing it down, slowing it. I'm slurring on my words, slowing down the tapering process. And it puts the U.S. in a strong position comparative to other central banks. But with the recent announcement where they discussed, you know, pulling back the balance sheet, you know, considering the uh, the slowdown in the raise of interest rates and maybe even cutting back interest rates if things get worse enough. It buys other central banks time. It allows them to take this kind of risk and monetary policy by continuing to build their balance sheet and continuing to lower interest rates or keep interest rates low because it's all about a war of keeping up equity markets and keeping up the value of your currency compared to others. And as we talked about again, with the central bank's decision, even though I, I do believe in, in FX markets, the major moves are you know something that is kind of not planned, but it, it's, it takes in a whole set of macro factors outside of just the central bank's policies, that this is the key thing that will drive currencies. We saw the dollar drop to a lot of other currencies during the announcement. Now, the second thing I want to discuss as well is now that we understand that the central banks are starting to you know continue propping up assets in this case, uh, can we expect the trend to continue? Uh, you know, can we can we continue to see this in global markets? And also, where is that liquidity flowing, right? That's a good question. Uh, I would say that most of it is going to be flowing to the market that is standing strongest at the moment, and that's the United States. But I'm not exactly sure, you know, in this case, if China will be able to allow, if that capital will be able to flow much out of China. The real market here that capital could flow out of is the ECB and the Bank of Japan. Right, that's where capital can move more freely. But 
long story short, we can see that this is having a really negative effect across the globe. And even in Japan, where we saw probably the biggest bolster per as of GDP in regards to the central bank balance sheet increase of their country, pension funds lost $136 billion in the past three months. And I think this is why Japan's acting so reactionary. They already own a vast majority of uh, Japan's ETFs. But this shows you that, you know, the, I think the, if you really want to call it a Ponzi, I hate to be all like cynical, uh, but I mean, God, we have not seen a quarterly loss like this in forever. 14.8 trillion yen lost between October and December. And no wonder there's such a leap up here in the central bank balance sheet. If they haven't even tapered the balance sheet, just imagine what happens when they dump their ownership of 80% or 85% plus ownership of Japan's ETFs. Just imagine when they start dumping treasuries on the open market and how that draws liquidity away from equities. I mean, that's what I worry about here. And I really recommend you look into this. This was the biggest pension fund. It's the Japanese or Japan's global pension investment fund lost 9.1%. Now, to be fair, we have to factor in a lot of the great um, you know, upside that this fund has seen. But because of the fund's overexposure to equities, and they stated that the reason for this was because, you know, right now, you know, global interest rates are still quite low. And, you know, in this case, because of that, it's best to put your capital in assets and not in a, you know, a, you know, simple streamlined uh, residual income assets like bonds or treasuries in this case. But the whole thing here is that this is the time period where I, I don't feel comfortable holding assets in this case. I feel like it's time where we're starting to see the reversal at monetary policy. That was the story for the past decade, but it's not anymore. And that's why I again went bearish in 2018, and I've still held that view as we've gone to the beginning of 2019. And so far, yeah, I've been a little bit right so far in this case of prices coming down. But uh, again, we're seeing some of the same old tricks coming in, and that's what propped up markets in January. Along with this as well, I like this here, more than $10 trillion in equity. And this puts it in perspective. We're not just talking about U.S. markets, we're talking about global markets. $10 trillion in equity value has been wiped out from global markets in the last quarter, in three months. Now, I, the reason I didn't highlight between the U.S. and China trade war concerns, this isn't the thing that's keeping markets down, guys. First off, it's a multitude of factors, right? Yes, I believe this plays into the role, right? Uh, people don't want to see free trade and they want to see things going well, especially you know in the sense of growing economic value in this case. That being realized, the biggest thing here is the central bank balance sheet. It has been the reason equity markets have propped up for the past few years. And it's just how the system flows, guys. That's it. Central bank balance sheets have been growing exponentially over the past few years. Uh, and, and the reason being is because that's just how the system runs now. We live in a boom and bust economy based off monetary policy. And if you cut off the intro of new capital to the economy, you're going to crash the economy. That's how it works nowadays. We don't have sound money. And that's how you know this whole system works here. Um, so anyways, you guys can look through the details here again. Major loss in foreign stocks, domestic stocks, and even bonds as well. The only thing they've got here is uh, domestic bonds in this case, which they made us a slight return on in this case. So, all right, speaking about markets, we'll talk about the last thing here. I know I've rambled on today, but we've got to talk about volatility here. Now, I've discussed volatility for some time now, talking about the higher levels here on the VIX, where we're beginning higher and higher bases, and we're setting in a third higher base, even with January coming in to be the savior of markets, even with the golden rally we've seen in January. We're still holding on this line that was previous resistance and has now become new support. Now, the next trading week, you know, starting off here at about, you know, it's a little less than a uh, little less than 30 minutes. Um, this trading week is going to be extremely imperative. If we break below this dramatically, if we break below this line of support here on the VIX, this means that we're probably actually because of the, you know, the reversal in central bank policies and more predominantly the Fed's decisions that we could see volatility break lower. And we actually might be able to retest to market highs in this case. I have my doubts about it, unless there's really a good positive catalyst that comes out. Because even with everything right now, which should be priced in, we're hitting resistance. And you can see it here in the volatility as well, as we'll take a look at the, the NASDAQ in a moment. If volatility holds here, if the NASDAQ can't get past the line of resistance that we've discussed previously, you're going to start seeing this cup up. And if it gets above this line, be prepared. Be very, very prepared. That is the only thing I'm going to say. 
<laughs> because as volatility increases, we know that markets tend to sell off. And as markets tend to sell off, uh, especially if volatility is picking up at an exponential pace, well, you can only assume that the market is following in that case because the VIX is following the market, right? So be very, very wary here, guys. Again, we talked about um, the moving averages here. I like to sometimes just uh, hide the price here and take a look at the moving averages. And if you take a look at the weekly here, I think it's the weekly or the monthly. Um, I, of course, I have my little thing here, but it's going to mess up. Here it is, the monthly here. I don't know why I got some messed up drawings, but you can generally see what I'm pointing to. This is the 50 month here on the VIX. Volatility is coming back, baby. It's coming back, and it's going to be coming back in a major, major way. So we got to be prepared for it, guys. We have to be prepared for when this starts to arrive, when these bases continue to get higher. I guess that's what my line was there. That was the line of support. I shouldn't have deleted that. But again, if this continues to hold here at around 16 points, this is much higher than where we were back at the record low volatility for 30 or 40 years in the market back in 2017. It's a very different nature. And again, just to provide some context from what I said earlier about the resistance line, if you can't get a good breakout above here or you get slammed down at the 200 day, yikes, that's not gonna be good. Not to mention we're already pretty overbought here. We're on the, uh, you know, we're not oversold in this case, which is what I think markets would like to be so they could continue the rebound. But again, not that far away from all time highs. We'll keep open to it, guys. We wait until a catalyst comes into play. And right now we are in the twilight zone. We don't do anything in the twilight zone. We remain patient. We can hold our opinions, but we hold back from pulling the trigger just yet. Anyways, that's it for the video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this daily update. And if there's something I missed, please leave it down in the comments down below. As always, I appreciate you guys sticking around, supporting the channel, and I wanna hear from you guys. So if you guys think about some content you wanna see, leave it down in the comments down below. Get a discussion going. Always love hearing from you guys. But until the next video, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Take care. I'll talk to you soon.